So in order to get this recurrence matrix for continuous time series, um, we usually take a step. This is actually not necessary, but because it's extremely interesting and um, well, pretty cool. Um, I am going to talk about it. It's called phase space reconstruction. Um, and it can help us to, um, yeah, to basically get a better idea about the dynamics that, uh, that are going on in uh, the system that you're studying. Um, this only works for continuous time series because uh, we have to uh, assume that the, that the values that we have, have observed actually mean something that we can calculate sort of the distance between them. Of course, you also have the distance metrics for um, for more categorical series, but that that really doesn't work here. Um, so. If we're talking about these uh, these complex dynamics, we've we've talked about scale-free and fractal dynamics, and everything is a very correlated and interaction-dominant, non-linear, maybe chaotic, and we have multiplicative interactions. Um, yeah, you might say, well, <laughs> that's problematic, right? Because we, we can't do anything anymore, or we have to measure everything. Um, and in fact, that's not true. Um, in fact, we can, we can use some mathematics um, to actually exploit the fact that everything is interacting, right? So if you have to make a distinction between traditional statistical inference and these types of techniques that we're discussing right now, it's statistical inference demands independence of observations, no interactions, no correlated errors, nothing of those kinds of things. And, and the stuff that we're talking about is, yes, please, everything must be interactive. Because otherwise, we, we cannot learn anything about, um, about uh, the dynamics of, uh, of our system. And so this technique here is based on uh, Dawkins and Benning theorem. So it's not, in terms of mathematical theorem, it's not very old. Uh, uh, I was alive when it was first <laughs> published. Uh, but could not read yet. But. Um, and Florent Sakens was a Dutch uh, mathematician, um, um, and it's called the Takens and Benning theorem. There are now more general theorems, um, and usually they are called embedding theorems or delay embedding theorems. And what it tells us is that you can um, recover the dynamics of any attractor, also a strange attractor, also these very chaotic attractors like the butterfly attractor. Uh, from observations of a single component process of a complex interaction dominant system. So the reason, so the original title was Detecting Strange Attractors in Turbulence. Um, and this is actually a mathematical proof that this is so, right? So the fact that, they, that the dynamics can be recovered is, is a mathematical proof. Um, but you need some ingredients. There aren't a lot of ingredients, but you need some. And one of them is, of course, well, you need interactions. Because if you don't have interactions, this does not work um, between system components. So um, uh, if you're really dealing with, uh, with these complex dynamics, probably generated by many different processes, interacting with many different uh, time scales, it implies that you have all these processes that are that are in one way or another are coupled. Right? So I think we've already uh, discussed the Lorentz system a little bit um, yesterday. So the Lorentz system, uh, which was used by Edward Lorentz to, to pr predict the weather, right? And this is the origin story of the, the famous uh, uh, butterfly quote, uh, the butterfly flaps at winds. It can make the difference between uh, a hurricane on the other side of the world. That's this model. So it's, it contains three um, differential equations, continuous equations. And as you can see, so these are just the three dimensions of the system, x, y, and z. And uh, as you can see, what happens to x over time depends on y. What happens to y over time depends on x uh, and z, of course, also y itself and x itself. What happens to Z over time depends on X and Y. So that's what we mean by coupled. That's what we mean by interacting. So the value of these diff the different uh, observables of the system really depends also on what's going on in, 
the other systems, and vice versa. So they're mutually dependent. So now Taken's theorem suggests that you actually do not need all three dimensions. You can do with one of these. Because if you know something about what's going on in Z, you also know something that's going on about X and Y. And in fact, the proof is you can use one of these time series to reconstruct the dynamics of the entire system. So you would, the dynamics you would get if you would have all three, and if you would have observed all three dimensions, uh, or three processes. And that the thing that you then reconstruct is actually um, equivalent, so it's not exactly the same, but the dynamics you recover are the same as the original. That's what the mathematical proof is about. So how do we do this? Okay, here we have the original, we have x, y, and z. Um, so x and y look very much the same, but they are a little bit lagged, and, and the scale is different here. Uh, but th this is what you get out if you, if you run this, uh, uh, these equations for some time. And if you put them all together and consider um, these three dimensions as a, as a state space, it means that each combination of values, x, y, and z, each coordinate here, is a state of the system at some point in time, right? So we start here somewhere, and then it goes like this, and then it, it gets into this, this uh, butterfly attractor. And this is, the this is a strange attractor, it's chaotic. It's sensitively dependent on initial conditions. If you start just a tiny bit here to the left, it can be a very small change in the decimal uh, places. Uh, you will end up at, uh, at a completely different um, um, uh, point in time at a different coordinate. Okay, so yeah, highly chaotic uh, attractor. And so the claim is we only have to look at x or y or z in order to uh, uh, learn something about the dynamics of the system. How do we do this? Do you have a question? <laughs> By a single factor. One. One. Only looking at x. And not at y and z. Well, one of the things we need to do and, um, is uh, create uh, um, uh, surrogate dimensions. So if we have one time series here, uh, we have to have a kind of a method with which we can create uh, uh, the, the other dimensions. We call this surrogate dimensions. So we know, don't know yet how many, well, we, we know because this is an example, we would need three. But, um, but we need a method also to decide right, how many we would need. And, and this method has to say, oh, you need three. Uh, that's the second step. The first step is if you want to create uh, these types of, uh, of uh, surrogate dimensions, uh, what might you use? What kind of criterion? And um, uh, well, one of the things you might want to be might want to do is if you want to use pieces of this time series, is to look uh, at which point maybe do I have uh, 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 which points gives me the most new information about the system. And intuitively, you could think about this as maybe where does the autocorrelation function become uh, non-significant, for instance. Right? At that time lag, we cannot make any predictions anymore based on the history of the system itself. So that's actually a, a spot where, where, where we might, uh, yeah, where new stuff is going on. So that might be a good point. But um, it would work something like this. So you need a method that needs to figure out some kind of delay, some kind of lag into the time series. And, and what we will do then is, is take, uh, just cut the time series at that point. Let's, let's call it T or tau. So at this point, and then we would use this as the uh, new starting point of our surrogate dimension. So we just take the time series from there, just copy it, and then uh, move it over there, and that's th this would be our, our second dimension. Again, I've, I've not yet talked about how we, we decide the delay, and I've not yet talked about how, how often we need to do this, but, but that would, that, that's actually the, the principle of the delay appending method. So we find a value tau that is sort of optimally giving us new information about the system, 
uh, so not based on its, uh, on, on the, its previous history. And we'll take that as the beginning of, the new, uh, of a new surrogate dimension. And we can repeat this. So if we would need uh, another dimension, and we already know we do, we could go to 2 tau, right? And then take that point, and then copy it again, and then uh, use that as the starting point of the third dimension. So we're basically just cutting up pieces of uh, our uh, observed uh, time series and using those as our circuit dimensions. Simple, right? But you might now be asking, well, how can that give us the original dynamics? Well, well you will be surprised. So how do we decide this tau? Um, it, it has to reflect a point in time where we're getting new information about the system. That's what I said. Uh, and the thing is, this, this specific, specific step is not really as, as important, so it's not really like a, like a crucial parameter setting. In theory, and that's what the mathematical theorem also says, you can use any lag, because everything is interacting. But what we're looking for is kind of a lag that would optimize the reconstruction. Uh, so intuitively, I already said uh, you could uh, think about this as, as looking at, uh, at the autocorrelation function, uh, maybe where it, uh, it goes to zero or it's not significant anymore. But uh, for, for these types of systems, this is a little bit problematic. Because if you look at the autocorrelation function for <coughs> time series, it never goes to zero. <coughs> so there are always... Um, correlations at every lag, and that's of, that, that has to do with the fact that it's just generated by an equation. Uh, so we do something else, and what we do is we don't look at correlation, but we look at something else which is called mutual information. Um, it's the same idea as correlation, just it's based on, on information theory, and it's an information theoretic measure that tells you, um, um, yeah, uh, for each lag, so uh, here uh, we have, for instance, at lag uh, one, uh, we, we have a lot of information about what's going to happen next. And this drops, 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 drops. And so here there's a local minimum here at lag 20, which would be uh, an indication of uh, um, uh, yeah, non-predictability. So if, uh, the value at lag 20 would be very difficult to predict based on, uh, uh, on 20 times steps back. So this is the formula, yeah, you don't have to know what it is. It's called average mutual information. And it's a kind of uh, summation of uh, frequencies and probabilities. Um, and you can also do this uh, for two different time series. So, so uh, uh, analyze whether they uh, share the same information and conditional. And there are all kinds of variations of this measure. But one thing to realize is it's not signed. It's not directional in correlation, right? So you, you only know something about a quantity of information that can be more or less. And of course, the, the maximum value here depends also on the, the, the degrees of freedom that, that you have available. Um, usually what we do is we use the first local minimum. So if you look at this uh, lagged mutual information function, we just say, well, the first local minimum would be a good idea. And this, this might be a little bit like the first point where the autocorrelation function also would drop uh, below the zero. But uh, you could also take, um, uh, there, you could, there, sometimes you have more like something like a global minimum, which is, but then it doesn't go up again. Uh, so you could use the first global minimum as well. Okay, so what would happen if we would take, so this would be our tau, it would be 20 or 15 or something like that. Um, and we would, would go 15 time steps into our, our, our time series and then use that as, as the next uh, dimension, as a surrogate dimension. Well, we get this. So here we have original x starting at the point that we observed it. And here we have um, x plus tau. And uh, you can already see that, that there's something going on here, uh, right? It looks like uh, there are at least two points here. 
looks like there's something orbiting. This is not the entire time series, this is just the uh, first uh, step here. Um, yeah, so um, looks already like something. Uh, of course, we don't know uh, yet whether this is sufficient. Uh, uh, so we need also a way to decide if we need more dimensions than just this. And um, the way to do this is to think about these points here, for instance. So here you have, in two dimensions, these points here appear to be lying all very close. So if you think about recurrences, uh, in two dimensions, these, these points would be probably be recurring values of the system. So the system is revisiting, this is the state space, revisiting the same location here. But now you can wonder, is that actually a sensible thing to, to, to assume that these points are are actually close together. What would happen if I would add another dimension? Would these points then still be close together? So the, the way to describe this is, in two dimensions, these points, points are neighbors. Are they still neighbors if I add another dimension? And I can just add it by taking two tau, right? Going again, uh, instead of 15 steps into my time series, I can go 30 steps and just create another dimension. So, and then what we're going to evaluate is whether these points are still next to one another, whether they are neighbors, or whether they turn out to be false neighbors. They weren't actually neighbors. But in a higher dimension, they are apart. And, of course, this analysis is called false nearest neighbor analysis. Right? So here they are close, and are they still close if I use three dimensions? Well, this is what it looks like in three dimensions. Again, this is just uh, the, the first, first part of the, uh, um, of the time series. Um, and and this was the, the, these were the points that we were looking at. And you can see that there are, some of them still actually are close, right? But a lot of them actually got separated. So it, a lot of them turned out to be false nearest neighbors in a higher dimension. Well, the cool thing is you can just repeat this. So you can say, okay, what happens in four dimensions? What happens in five, six, seven? You can just go on because, well, as long as your time series is long, of course, because some, at some point you, your time series uh, is, uh, is done. Uh, so, yeah, this is just describing what I, uh, what I just said. So it turns out uh, that some of those points are actually far apart in, uh, in three dimensions. And so the analysis does, is doing this for you, of course. And we know that we should get three, because the, our system is made up of three uh, differential equations. So this is listing the percentage or the proportion of false nearest neighbors. Of course, uh, you know, if you start out in one dimension, everything is a neighbor. And then if you use two already in this case, you, you drop to almost zero, but then three, if you use three dimensions, there are no, uh, uh, no points anymore that, uh, that can be considered false neighbors if you go up in higher dimensions. So this is a very ideal graph. You don't usually see these graphs uh, with real data. But uh, what you would do uh, with real data is also look at uh, when does this percentage of false neighbors drop, and that would be uh, a good point to, uh, to decide on how many dimensions you need. Um, so in this case, we would choose three dimensions. And we know this to be correct, because yeah, we have the Lorentz system, and it has three uh, dimensions. Um, or let's say the dynamics right, are, are generated by three, at least three couple processes. This uh, technique is also used by modelers uh, to figure out, you know, if you're presented with one time series, how many ordinary differential equations do I minimally need in order to uh, uh, simulate these dynamics? Right? So if I want to model the dynamics, uh, how many uh, ordinary differential equations, how many coupled ordinary differential equations would I minimally need to model it? Um, yeah, but for real data, usually it doesn't go exactly to zero. But you would start then with uh, the number of dimensions, for instance, that drop, you know, 10% 10, 10 false news neighbors or something like that. Uh, if you do these types of analyses on um, data from human 
human subjects. Depends, of course, a little bit uh, what you're looking at. But for instance, uh, physiological types of things like uh, postural sway or maybe um, mouse movements, something like that. You usually also end up like three or four. But if you if you go to the response time series, it usually uh, it's much higher. It's, you get uh, you can get up to ten, or twelve, or thirteen. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the idea. Uh, I mean, it's not very complicated, right? It's it's it's, it's just yeah, pretty straightforward. We have to find some delay based on some principle, and actually it's an kind of optimization, so it's, it's not, not uh, important to get it exactly right. Uh, but then this uh, technique is just uh, looking at, well, uh, what, if I add more dimensions, what happens? Are points still neighbors, or are they not neighbors? And then we just stop when, when we cannot get any more points to separate. Okay. Well, what does it look like? It looks like this. So this is the Lorentz system reconstructed from only looking at x. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, but it's not exactly the same, right? It does not visually look exactly the same. But uh, that's not what the theorem promised us. The theorem promised us topological equivalence is the term, uh, which means that all the all the interesting properties of this structure here um, are actually the same as the original. So this means that all the dynamical properties, this, the fact that there are two points with orbits that can be very sensitive to initial conditions, all those kinds of things, those are retained. And in terms of, uh, I think it's, is it differential geometry? Yeah. Uh, this means that there is a transformation uh, possible, th thinkable, that would that you could use, you, you can twist it, you can stretch things, but you cannot cut things, right, and reattach things. That's that's not allowed. But there is a transformation, uh, uh, thinkable, uh, that would give you the exact uh, original attractor. Uh, but but in order to do that, yeah, that, that would be a kind of very complex calculation. But it, in theory, it is possible to to stretch it in a way that it would ex be exactly the same. So this is just. Uh, a different representation of the same dynamics, basically. So this is what happens if you uh, use y, the y dimension. Again, the important thing is we have two points and we have orbits around them. And this is what happens if you would use z. Uh, it's a little bit twisted, but, but actually the two points are here. And then now, now it has a like, kind of twist in it. But, but for, the, for the dynamics of the trajectory, that's actually not... Uh, uh, not very different. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's amazing. Can, can, can you give me some practical uh, example where, where you use this method in your research? Yeah. Um, I will show you an example, which is not my research, but it's, which is very interesting. But for instance, uh, I showed you the dyslexia uh, with the fractal dimension and the reading performance, right? So we also did RQA there, uh, and then we used uh, this uh, reconstruction, reconstruction technique also, and then, and then also correlated this with reading performance. Uh, but what I have not told you yet is, is what happens, uh, 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 what role a recurrence quantification plays. So, so that's, that's something we still have to look at, because that, that's, that's the next step. But you, yeah, if you have continuous data, this is we also do studies with uh, postural sway, where or with uh, where, where people have to use like the Wii remote controller to do things and stuff like that. So all those kinds of, uh, of, of, of data where we would eventually want to use recurrence quantification analysis to get an idea about the dynamics of this state space. We also do state space reconstruction. Yeah, but maybe it helps if I show you the uh, the example uh, in. <laughs> I think that, yeah. uh, so, a question about those surrogate dimensions. Yeah. Uh, can you ascribe some like theoretical meaning for those like you yeah. try to do in factor analysis? Yeah, I, I can't stop thinking about these parallels between them. <laughs> yeah. so, so, can we like uncover some you can hidden 
dynamics or hidden yeah. varying properties with this? If you want to do, if you want to do what the physicists use this for and do modeling, you you have to do this, right? So you have to get an idea about what it actually is. I personally never have done this, uh, but it should be possible. Yeah, it should be. Um, you can use it as, as a tool uh, for this, but it, it, of course the analysis doesn't specify what it should be. It just gives you a number, and, and yeah, you minimally need this amount of differential equations, a couple of processes, in order to, to, to recreate these dynamics. So then that's, for free, might be okay, but <laughs> yeah. for 10, but after doing that, you get the time series for all those target dimensions. Yeah. Also, uh, so you could compare them against some criteria which you could use to yes. infer the meaning, yes. the possible meaning for yes. those. Well, uh, the meaning I don't know, but what you at least can do is uh, you can use this, these techniques also for prediction. So you can try to figure out how well the reconstruction is predicting other time series, for instance, that you know what they mean. Uh, those kinds of things are all possible. And if you follow this link here, at least I hope it's that link. Um, yeah. This is a really nice, uh, so we're not going to watch this entire thing, but uh, this is really nice animation and description of uh, what I just told you, <laughs> using also this. And it, is, it belongs to, uh, it's, it's uh, associated with a paper, I'm not sure, yeah, I think it's this one. Yeah, so here in, in the description is also the link to the paper. And they uh, use this uh, reconstruction technique also to do what I just said, so try to predict other time series or, pre or, or get a prediction of the time series itself. So they do all kinds of uh, very cool uh, things uh, with it. And we are only just now very recently starting to use these things. So, uh, so is it like cross-validating for this phase based yeah. reconstruction? Yeah. Yeah, so you can use it to, uh, so you can take one part of your time series and, and, and then, then predict, try to predict what's, what's coming next. And you can, can get a kind of prediction error or, or non-linear prediction skill, those kinds of things. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's what's described in that paper. There's also an R package uh, for it. So uh, it's called REDM, Empirical Dynamics. But um, yeah. Uh, Can you say a few words about the amount of data needed for to do the reconstruction? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so you need, of course, to to be able to to have observed the process that you're interested in uh, long enough. Uh, for them to display the dynamics that you're interested in, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, but uh, so this can be can be very different for different types of um, of observables, right? Different types of variables <coughs> that you're interested in. Um, of course, it works best with more data, right? So so if you have long time series, this this probably is is uh, uh, preferred, but. It is possible to do these things with, with 80 day time points or, or, or 100 or something like that, maybe even 50. And the limit is how many dimensions does the, does the analysis say you need? Because yeah, you need to have time series left <laughs> right, to construct the dimensions. And what, what, what would be the optimal lag? But there you can cheat a little bit. You can say, I will just use one because my time series is very short. And that should not really uh, affect the, uh, the, the results. You, you Get. Um, but you can imagine if you have a time series of 50 and uh, the mutual information says you need the lag of 25 and but you need 10 dimensions then you're already done you, you can't you can go any further so the, so the limits are more in in terms of um, do you think you really have observed the, the interesting dynamics and and what does the reconstruction procedure tell you uh, that you would need to get an optimal reconstruction but it's not it's not uh, impossible to do this for uh, yeah for shorter time series yeah all right um, 
Yeah. It is amazing, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> It is amazing. So, so we did what we just did is we reconstructed something that is extremely chaotic and, and all these kinds of weird stuff that we talked about yesterday is going on. And, and, and why can we do this? Because everything is interacting, right? Because it's a complex system and, and everything is coupled to everything. Um, and, and yeah, so you would actually need only to measure one variable of the system. Um, we exploit the dependencies in the data. Oh yeah, here you have the length of the data set needs to be long enough to create the certain dimensions. And um, yeah, this is very important. So it does not make any assumptions about the data, right? So it's just you need to be able to think about the different dimensions as coordinates in a space from which you can calculate a dis uh, some kind of distance measure, because that's what uh, we will eventually use um, uh, also for the uh, recurrence analysis. So for instance, in the case of the random number generation, um, it would make a lot of sense to do the reconstruction there because yeah, the order of these numbers doesn't have anything to do with the thing that you're interested in, in which is the sequence in which they occurred, or even for the words also. yeah. The word the gets assigned the number one, but that doesn't mean it. Right? So, so for the categorical data sets, the unordered categorical data sets, uh, it usually doesn't make a lot of sense to do this reconstruction. Uh, but once you have like a, a response time or well anything that can be uh, can, can be ordered on a scale, uh, you can already do this. So. What would happen if we had measured a truly uh, white noise variable? What would happen if we would reconstruct, try to reconstruct it? What do you think? If we would have to determine the embedding lag. We know something about what happens if you look at the autocorrelation function of, um, of white noise. Do you remember from yesterday what happened? You get like, a, if it's really white noise, you get only a correlation of one at lag zero, because it's, the value is only correlated with itself. So if you do the mutual information, um, yeah, you probably end up with some, well, either nonsense, but, but yeah, you, you probably end up, okay, let's just take lag one, because we can take lag zero. And the mutual information is, uh, is actually telling you this. Uh, so this is the mutual information for white noise. So it's, it's just saying at lag one, we have zero, basically. Uh, so well, let's take lag one. And then uh, you do the false nearest neighbor analysis. Very interestingly, this will not tell you, you there are no dimensions here. One of the reasons is, um, depending a little bit on what you what, what kind of distribution you sampled from. But um, uh, yeah, you will find if you if you increase the, the dimensions that you will for a prolonged period of time you will find neighbors, points that were close together just by chance, that are now separated. And and yeah you can find these kinds of things so you might actually need four dimensions. Uh, to uh, describe the dynamics that are going on in this uh, time series. But actually what this means is, if you think about um, my comments on, um, so if you have the logistic map, which is the discrete version right, of, the, of the, the dynamics, you only have a, you need a one dimensional system and you can already have these, this deterministic chaos going on. But if you have continuous data, continuous systems, you need minimally three. You need three ordinary differential equations to create something that looks like it's random, right? So that's why we get sort of three, four, five for white noise. So you need minimally three coupled differential equations for it to become uh, um, uh, random. So I don't actually remember how I created this, but it's possible that this is actually created by a pseudo, <laughs> pseudo random number generator that is using, well, at least four differential equations. I would have to check this, but uh, that would be very neat if that's the case. Anyway, let's suppose we just use also three, right? Three dimensions. 
in lab one. Well, what do we get if we reconstruct this? Well, we get a state space that is completely occupied, or at least most most of the state space is actually occupied by this uh, by this attractor, which is what, what we would expect because the random system will will move eventually over time uh, to occupy all the degrees of freedom that are available. So it's not it's not really bounded like the strange attractor. It's uh, it's going everywhere. Um, yeah, so the topological equivalence, I already talked to you about this, this is just for your reference. Uh, the here I'm also saying something about you would probably get uh, 10 dimensions. So what does it mean to go, if you go above three dimensions? Of course, you cannot visualize the state space anymore. But what it just means is you have uh, a coordinate of, uh, which has 10 numbers. Right? So you have a 10 uh, and 2 pole coordinate. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's no longer uh, possible to, to visually inspect it. Um, but what is the cool thing? We can, even if you have 10 dimensions, we can create a recurrence matrix based on uh, those types of, uh, of reconstructed attractors. So uh, that's what I will show you next. Or maybe, oh yeah, I can still show it to you. Um, yeah, so, um, so that's where the recurrence quantification analysis comes in. So after you've reconstructed it, there is actually a way to, uh, um, to create a recurrence matrix. Yeah, so, so you have really have to think about these things as, as coordinates in space. Uh, so this was the original, uh, this is what happens if you use x, y, and z. So, this, so that's sort of a setup right now. Um, uh, oh yeah, I, oh yeah. Well, these these were a little bit out of order. These slides, but if you want to know what it what it means to be topologically equivalent, I really can recommend this video. Um, here they call it homeomorphic. Uh, this is from one of my favorite YouTube channels, uh, uh, Number File, which is about maths and stuff like that. And this is one of my favorite people they have on there. Um, Cliff Cliff Stoll is his name. Um, and what he's doing here, he's showing you what what topological equivalence means. So uh, I think he goes from uh, uh, this object to and, and tries to stretch it and, and change it to this object and explains that, that that's actually uh, the, the same object for all intents and purposes. This object has exactly the same properties as this one, but also as this one, and, and all kinds of other things. So that's a good. Uh, um, a good uh, way to uh, think about what this topological equivalence actually means. All right, so but how do we get to the recurrence uh, matrix? So, like I said, it's, it's important to think of these things as coordinates. So if we plot here our three uh, dimensions, which have three coordinates, and we plot it against itself, right, so here we have uh, time just uh, walking, and what is what is what is what does it mean here? Well, the coordinates change, so the values here of these three things they change over time, and this this refers to a different location in the state space, right? So it's moving through the state space. So so our time series actually is a sequence of coordinates, which tells us what what the trajectory is through state space that this system is going. And, and we're talking about auto recurrence, so we, we, we just plot the same time series, all right, on the x-axis and the y-axis, just like we did with the story, right? So now, yeah, we cannot we cannot say directly, uh, hey, this this thing is recurring, but we can say uh, because it's a coordinate, uh, uh, does the system come close again to this coordinate? Right. So what you see here now, uh, in, in color coded, is actually the Euclidean distance between these two uh, uh, between points. So we start out at time one. This has a specific coordinate value here, x, y, z, and we're looking up into the future of the time series and comparing all the co coordinates that, that the system will go to and, and just calculating the distance. Uh, to these uh, coordinates uh, relative to uh, uh, our current position, right? So 
we're evaluating, we're, so this could be somewhere, I don't know, here, I don't know where we started, here, and we're going to look up and look at all the other coordinates and figure out how far away we are from that particular uh, uh, location. So here we could be here, for instance, this data point, and we're going to look at all the other data points. So this one, for instance, could be over here somewhere, but it is actually uh, uh, kind of close, right? So, but the way to do this is very simple. Uh, if you remember maybe uh, geometry class <laughs> from mathematics, right? You, you just uh, subtract, if you have uh, like three coordinates, you just subtract the, uh, the two plus and, and square it and then take the square root. And that's your Euclidean distance. That's just how you calculate Euclidean distance. There are different type, uh, types of distance measures that you could use. Um, but, um, but this is very simple. Way. So, and it, it doesn't matter if you have 10 dimensions, this thing would just be like, like 10 coordinates long. But you can still calculate uh, a distance measure from, uh, from many, many more of these pairs of, uh, of uh, coordinates. Right? So it's just the difference of these two points uh, on each uh, dimension square it and then take the square root. So now, so, so then you have a distance value and then you need to decide is this close or not, right? So you have to pick a kind of uh, a radius uh, uh, which, which represents a distance and then you can say, okay, everything that falls around, that, that comes uh, within this radius around this uh, coordinate is actually, um, is actually close and the other stuff is not. Okay, so here we have our distance matrix. So this would also sometimes be called an unthresholded recurrence matrix. And we have to decide, so red here, the red colors means close, right? So the distance is always like almost zero. Yeah, this should be up here. And then a blue is very far away. So we, we should choose uh, yeah, a, a distance that we think, yeah, now it's actually recurring. So it can be somewhere here. Or, um, there are, of course, all kinds of uh, uh, rules of thumb and techniques in order to decide what you might need. Um, oh yeah, let me just put in these things here. Yeah. Um, so th so the, th this, this line here should be red because that's exactly the, the, the same coordinate, right? So that, that would be actually exactly zero. And, um, and, and the idea is to uh, uh, to get now our recurrent points. So if you if you've decided on a on a threshold, it could be something like point two or something like that. Uh, what you then do is that, that everything that is point two that is separated by distance of point two, you make that a recurrent point, and the rest becomes white. Right, just like you did in the in the Excel with the words. Uh, but now you you base this not on the similarity of the words, but you base it on the the distance. The, uh, the point is uh, from the, the current point that you're observing. And you might end up with stuff like this. All right, so uh, these are continuous signals. We have, here we have a sine wave. We have a thin oscillation. Yes. And um, yeah, you, you can do the same calculation. So the number of recurrent points would still be the same calculation that you already performed. Because now we don't have any distances anymore, we just have recurrent points here. Um, so you can calculate the percent uh, of uh, recurrent points. So what is actually a good idea for a good criterion for choosing your the radius or the threshold? Um, you, can, you can test this, right? So what have, how many recurrent points do I get if my radius is 3? How many do I get if my radius is 5? Of course, if I increase this, this distance um, of points which I call close together, you will get uh, a larger and larger uh, uh, number of recurring points. Uh, and usually what we, what we do is we, we, we say, okay, we will choose a radius that gives us a certain number of recurring points, for instance, 5% recurrence rate, right? And then uh, you can do this for, uh, for all the um, uh, if you have measured several subjects, you can do this for all the subjects, and you, you're sure that, that you're looking at recurrence plots that have the same number of recurrent points. 
Uh, and what you then can still do is that this radius that you need to get 5% recurrent points, that can be a variable actually in the analysis. So there might be people where you need a very large radius to even get 5% recurrence. Right? This, this can mean something. And this can tell you something also about this dynamics. So yeah, that's actually, so once you have this, you can just calculate all the uh, different uh, uh, recurrence measures that we talked about. This is actually a plot of the a recurrence plot of the Lorentz attractor. That looks something like this if you want uh, at least 2.9 recurrent points. Yeah, this is a list of all the kinds of things we do. And the list is actually much longer, but uh, these are the most, most common ones. And um, also the ones that uh, most of these uh, software packages will give you. And the most, most important ones are, of course, the recurrence rate, determinism, and uh, laminarity. Oh, that's a good uh, timing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just done. <laughs> oh, yeah, my battery is <laughs> Yeah, this was literally the last slide for, for this. Thing. So, um, so let's have lunch, and then uh, when we go back, I'll give the example. Uh, I'll talk about it.